You're welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this event. It's a great pleasure to have you in this environmental compliance training workshop for mining and manufacturing sector. At the end of the workshop, participants should be able to answer the following questions. First, what is Environmental Impact Statement, EIS? What is Hazardous Substance Storage Plan, HSSP? What is Environmental Audit, EAU? What is Environmental Protection and Rehabilitation Program, EPRP? What is Community Development Agreement, CDA? Secondly, how to go about developing and executing the terminologies? In today's workshop, we have two training sessions, the morning session and the afternoon session. In the morning session, we'll go through introduction and review of environmental regulations and guidelines for the mining sector in Nigeria. This session is going to last for one hour, 30 minutes. I will introduce the speaker. She will take us through the environmental regulations and we will take questions and answers. In the afternoon and by 3 p.m. precisely, we will look at how to marry the environmental regulations with our learning outcomes being EIS, HSSP, EAU, EPRP, and CDA. This event is being hosted by Rich Flood International Limited. Rich Flood is a leading continental provider of environmental and social due diligence services for investment in Africa. The firm works closely with investors and leaders in the public and private sectors of different economies in Africa, providing a range of services related to impact assessment of investment projects. With its current activities, Rich Flood have established partnerships in the United States and United Kingdom with operational partnerships in a few African countries, namely South Africa, Egypt, Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda, with its headquarters in Abuja, Nigeria. Our first presenter will take you through some of our capacity building activities in Nigeria. Now let's listen to the housekeeping rules. First, we would like all participants to be muted and also put off their videos for maximum efficiency in the course of this event. You can as well tender your questions or suggestions in the chat box. This button is located at the bottom of your screen on a computer and at the top on a tablet. Kindly rename yourself and add your location after your name in brackets so that whenever you ask a question, we can know where you are from and how to answer you appropriately. I would like to introduce our trainer of today, Dr. Comfort Asokoro Ogaji, the founder and group managing director of Rich Flood Group, working on environmental and social governance for investment projects in Africa. She holds a PhD in strategic management and is continuously working on global climate crisis, business sustainability strategies, and competitive advantage, focusing on how in African investors can strategically consider climate change in their investment decisions for investment sustainability. As of 2020, she has coordinated and performed oversight duty on approximately 200 investment projects in Nigeria, ensuring environmental and sustainability considerations are incorporated in project planning all through operational and decommissioning phases. The stage is yours, Dr. Comfort. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thanks very much for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Dr. Comfort Asokoro Ogaji. I'm a fellow of IEMA, and I'm happy to uh, come up with this uh, slide I'm about to share with you. I'm happy to be part of the capacity building program for the mining sector 
in Nigeria. And uh, though this is not the first time we are doing this, I have worked in many states in Nigeria in, in uh, relevance to uh, what we are doing today. Though before the COVID um, period, we used to have this event face to face, but post COVID era, we are now having it um, online. I will share with you briefly uh, before I go into my presentation proper, our experience in Lagos, uh, Lagos State, where we had operators just like you, but targeted in Lagos State, uh, about 119 participants that attended the event uh, that we had, uh, rich flood in collaboration with uh, Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency. So I would share with you right now this um, video, which is just, I think about five minutes. It's about five minutes video. I will share with, share with you and then we can go deep into the documents that we are going to be reviewing today. So, um, Rich Flood is working with the mining and the manufacturing sectors to understand what is required for um, uh, regulatory compliance, most especially what documentation and activities are required by the mining and manufacturing sectors to be able to manage the environmental uh, regulations demand, which I will share with you also briefly in my presentation. So it is important to have this knowledge, most especially if you're operating in Nigeria and your activities uh, or your plan to operate in Nigeria. This presentation is, is, is uh, something you need to have so that you can get familiar with the regulations that concerns the mining sector and also the regulations that concerns the manufacturing sector. But my presentation, like you can see on the screen, is going to focus only on the mining sector while another presenter will take on the manufacturing sector. So once again, I'm happy to be here. And uh, let me just quickly share with you the video and then we dig down deep into other um, activities. If there is time, I may share with you another experience I had at uh, YOLA. Yola Adamawa State in Nigeria and also Meduguri, um, Borno State in Nigeria. It was quite interesting and uh, the feedback was great. I was so happy to see the impact that this training was having, I mean, had on the participants. And I do hope that today, as we are having this event, that the same impact will be felt by the participants and that you would uh, return to your operations and incorporate um, the findings or the understandings that you'll be able to gather from this event. So thank you again and let me just share here with me, let me dig out the video and share with you in a moment. Rich Flood International in collaboration with Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency, have trained 119 assessment practitioners on environmental impact assessment to ensure a sustainable environment. Speaking during the training, the chief consultant, Rich Flood International, Dr. Comfort Asukuro Ogaji, said the training was necessary to ensure that stakeholders understood the concept, principles, procedures, and benefits of conducting environmental social impact assessments before the projects are carried out. The initial objectives is to identify predicts, prediction, predicts, and evaluate the economic, environmental, and social impact of development activities to provide information on the environmental consequences for decision making and to promote environmentally sound and sustainable development through the identification of appropriate alternatives and mitigation measures. So, benefits of EIA execution is to potentially screen out environmentally unsound projects. Sometimes we redesign the projects during the Asia. The training is really important because of the um, significant uh, need to have uh, environmental and social impact assessment done for development projects. That's uh, when I say development project, I mean investments uh, into infrastructure projects like uh, road construction, power generation project, large scale agricultural projects, and uh, any projects that tampers with the environment, with the land, with 
air quality with water we have to conduct environmental and social impact assessment for it so this event is important because most projects in nigeria do not undergo environmental impact assessment environmental and social impact assessment which i call asia is uh, is a tool of sustainable development that ensures that these projects are executed sustainably on his part the founder african environmental action network dr victor fodeke urged policymakers to integrate strategic environmental impact assessment as a tool for achieving sustainable development goals. Strategic environmental assessment has been identified as a critical tool for improving sustainability of plants, the okay, and work, programs, and work, and the environment, and the purpose of the five pitch the 17 goals. The five pitch talks about what, the first one is what, the people, In the course of this training on environmental social impact assessment, I've learned uh, that there's a need for all of us to be ambassadors of the environment. And uh, also that before projects are commenced, there's a necessity to carry out environmental impact assessment to see how it will affect the environment, the people, in the environment and the ways to mitigate against certain risk. So it's important for certain projects, even before uh, awarding such projects out, to carry out the environmental impact assessment uh, so as to minimize the negative impact on the environment. I hope that you enjoyed that video that was uh, in Lagos State. And right now I'm showing, I wouldn't have the time to show you the um, video for Adamawa State, but here we are. Um, this was another course that was uh, done in uh, Adamawa State where we engaged with stakeholders and have them um, understand the concept of uh, environmental impact assessments. These are majority uh, operators and also uh, amongst them are uh, also um, um, environmental uh, practitioners and also operators just like you. So also is the um, Meduguri outing by Rich Flood and uh, where I was able to talk to operators like you and uh, regulators as well. This was in 2019 on the importance of environmental monitoring. And uh, this, is, this picture is actually Borno State Environmental Monitoring uh, Laboratory of Bosepa, that's Borno State Environmental Protection Agency. It was quite a good experience and uh, we had a nice time uh, understanding what the roles of regulators are and what the importance of uh, uh, ESIA, ESMPs and all that. If you have questions, please just drop the questions. Uh, you know, I believe questions are already running in your mind. So I also believe that uh, you would, this will be very, very interactive session for us, just like it has always been, even though this time around we are working online but I want to believe it to be quite interactive. Uh, other states we have visited includes uh, Kano states and uh, quite a number of states in Nigeria. But this time around, like I said in my introduction, we are doing this online and I would urge us to please make it really, really worthwhile. Let the time you are going to spend here be worthwhile, jot down the outcomes and let us uh, be able to be happy that uh, we had this together and we invested this time to understand what is required for your project and how to comply with the environmental regulations and also what environmental documents are required 
for your project. So just give me a second to get back to my presentation slides and we can take it up from there. Just a second. Okay, I found it. So here we are. I will run quickly into the um, general introduction again and see how we do on the um, paper that I am presenting. Okay. So um, I have introduced Rich Flood, I believe, and also my video must have introduced a lot about Rich Flood. But generally, uh, Rich Flood is a, we, we are all environmental practitioners at Rich Flood, and we have our offices, our headquarters in Abuja, and uh, our branch offices in the UK, the US, and some selected African countries what we do majorly and our vision is to continuously promote sustainable development, uh, sustainable investments in Africa. So we also work with uh, certification bodies for persons, management systems and, and products on a wide range of uh, international standards. In this presentation, I will show you some of our partners for this certification. Uh, we do quite a number of trainings to get uh, uh, people certified to become professionals in the field of sustainability as a whole and uh, a number of standards. I will show you a number of standards that Rich Flood undertakes uh, generally so that if you think to take these courses to the next level, not just to have this preliminary knowledge we are, that we are going to be sharing today, you can also contact us for your professional certification for either your system your, your management systems or selected persons in your in your firm or your products or services as the case may be so our work in nigeria has been smooth um recently we recorded quite a huge number of clients that we have serviced um i think over 200 clients that we have serviced in nigeria as regards to environmental management it could be environmental and social impact assessment or environmental auditing or environmental monitoring in one way or the other, you know, for different investment, different projects and uh, different operations in Nigeria. So we work with uh, regulatory bodies in Nigeria. And since this is this my presentation has to do with uh, the mining sector, I would mention a few regulatory bodies that we have been working with. One of it is the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development, which is the major, I mean, the anchor ministry for all, um, all mining uh, sector activities. We also work, of course, with the Mining Cadastral Office that issues licenses, because part of the requirements also has to do with uh, um, environmental management uh, plans and uh, specific documentations required even before the commencement of the project and um, some commitments of the uh, proponents, uh, mining proponents, some of the commitments that are required to be documented before the project commences, before issuance of licenses. And in the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development still we have the Mines Environmental Compliance Department that we work with um, closely. I'm going to share with you some of the documentations that are like guiding documents for most of the services that we offer in the mining sector and you are really going to like it. So, um, yeah, so another agency that we work with is uh, the Nestria. Um, it's not actually like a, an agency under the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development, but it's an agency that is concerned about the mining sector and regulates uh, using specific environmental laws, regulates the activities of the mining sector uh, in one way or the other. Nestra is the National Environmental Standards and Regulations Enforcement Agency. I will share with you some few regulations that uh, Nestra uh, is using for the mining sector if we have the time in the course of my presentation. So next is um, this particular workshop uh, was supposed to be held at Open States, Nigeria, 
uh, in collaboration with uh, specific regulators there. But like I said, since we made it an online workshop, we have decided to <laughs> not say that it is for a state this time around. It's for everybody. It's online. Anybody can hook up from anywhere. And um, I'm still going to, if I have the chance, I'm going to make a presentation during the afternoon session as well uh, on this key area. So I'll try my best to cover uh, environmental impact statement and um, uh, environmental auditing and environmental protection rehabilitation program, EPRP. And also I'll talk a little bit, maybe not a little bit, maybe I'll talk a lot about CDA that's because you know community issues are very very important when it has to do with the mining sector so I would try to cover as much as I can cover for the uh, community development agreement while later on I will talk about um, hazardous substance storage plan and I will also mention some specific international standards with regards to this later on in the afternoon if if the moderators can let me share again with you. So again, if you have any questions with regards to this, please, I would like to be seeing them now so that immediately I am done with my paper, I can attend to all of them as much as possible. Okay, moving on to laws and regulations. Um, I have selected these few laws and regulations that I think are closely related to my presentation today. And basically, you can see on the screen, we have the mining and processing of coal or industrial minerals. This is uh, um, one of the regulations that Nestria uses for enforcement. And also we have noise and noise standards and control. Uh, one also of the regulations that Nestra uh, would follow up with and ensure that the mining sector complies with. And we have the quarrying and blasting operations. So we also have a number of guidelines for uh, the solid mineral sector in Nigeria. And I will try to look at it. The last one being number eight is the operational guidelines for Mineral Resources and Environmental Management Committee, MIREMCO. I have worked with this committee before and I think they are very good at what they do. And I would like to share with you the guideline that uh, promotes their operation. So I would start from the coal or industrial minerals uh, law. Um, I will not be detailed in this particular slide, this particular uh, page because I have done another training before that have looked at all of those laws. So if you go to the YouTube channel of Rich Flood, uh, the YouTube official, I think is called, please can one of the Rich Flood staff help us post the link to the Rich Flood, um, to the Rich Flood YouTube channel so that uh, you can find comprehensively some of those laws that uh, the training that has been done uh, reviewing some of these laws and enabling you as um, I think it was done for our clients and we decided to make it a public um, presentation so you can you can go and pick some of the copies while we just talk skeletally about the um, about the, this few ones that I have put here but if you need something more detailed you can go and browse the Rich Flood official YouTube channel, which I believe by now the link will be on your chat uh, page. You can click on it and, and save the link so that at the end of this event, if you don't have it, you will not uh, lose it. It's very important if you're interested in knowing about the laws and regulations, excuse me, in knowing about the laws and regulations that governs the mining sector and you really want to comply with all of them and be up to date with what you do in terms of uh, regulatory compliance, then you, 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 if, you, if this falls into, if you fall into the category of this uh, uh, set of persons, please go to the Rich Flood 
YouTube channel, like the channel, and also follow on some of the trainings that we are going to be posting there. So let me share with you some of those laws and we can go to the next slide. Uh, just a second. So here we go. Um, this is the Nigerian National Environmental Quarrying and Blasting Operations Regulation. So I would just, um, this regulation is available at the Nestria office. You can buy it there uh, because we don't sell it. But recently I was selling um, my team members to publish it on the Rich Flood website, but um, they will require the approval of uh, Nestria office for us to do that so that you, it is available for you to check what needs to be done and how you need to do what in your operation as regards to uh, blasting and as regards to quarrying operation. So the objective of the regulation is to control the effect effects uh, to control the effects of quarrying and blasting operations on the environment and human health and specifically the regulations aim to prevent environmental degradation to ensure the use of environment environment friendly technologies in quarrying operations to sustain the carrying capacity of the nigerian land and prevent the contamination of surface and groundwater and to encourage the use the wise use of um, the wise use and exploitation of natural resources to prevent uh, air and noise pollution and also avoid interferences with drainages during the quarrying operations and also ensure the safety of the workers. So there are um, a number of, um, sorry, there are a number of uh, actions that are required by the quarry operators and you can see here in this law you have the environmental impact assessment which shall be conducted for all new quarries before the commencement of operations before the commencement of operations why i'm repeating it is because um most times uh the operators will reach us after the 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 the, the operations have commenced they will reach us that uh, they now want to do EIA at that point. It's actually um, a little bit late to get EIA done because EIA is done before commencement of the operations and environmental impact statements submitted to the agency. During the course of my presentation, I was to talk about EIS, but since we are here now, I can mention it. EIS, environmental impact statement, is the... Um, statement that you received after the conduction of environmental impact assessment. So usually when you get a letter from Nestria, you will be um, having some content saying that uh, you should submit an EIS to the agency. So it is captured in this paragraph four of the agency um, that you should uh, submit the EIS to the agency and uh, also submit environmental audit um, reports or conduct the same on all existing quarries. So environmental audit is done after the quarry, um, after the uh, uh, operations have commenced at the quarry. So there are lots of, um, activities to undertake when you are actually uh, in the quarry business. There are a lot of uh, um, actions you are, you're supposed to take in order to mitigate the impact of uh, your activities on the environment. There are mitigation measures. You can see this clause number eight, that uh, mitigation measures shall form an integral part of the quarrying operational plan, operation plan, and such measure, measures shall include information specified in Schedule 7. So you can see down here the scope of the plan that you will need to have for the quarry sector. You have the environmental monitoring guidelines, construction guidelines, uh, waste management plan, traffic management plan, health and safety plan. 
Now let's go to this clause 11. It says a quarry operator shall ensure that all field workers are equipped with PPEs. The, the, the operator shall ensure the provision of designated muster point, provision of functional fire hydrant, and so many other provisions. Now, very important for the quarry sector, you can see air pollution here. Dust and particulate matters emitted from all operations in the quarry shall be abated and suppressed using the best available technologies. There are technologies that can ensure that you have a dust-free operation. You are also required to have an EMP, that's an environmental management plan, during your operation. This is also captured in the um, regulation for blasting and quarrying activities. So it's actually very robust. I would advise that um, you go to our channel at Rich Flood on YouTube and see all of the activities that you ought um, to undertake in order to ensure a safe mining, a safe quarrying operation. So I will go now to the second law that I wanted to share with you, the second regulation, just a second. Let me see that I wanted to share with you. Just hold on for me, let me find it. Okay, so I found it. Here is um, the National Environmental Mining and Processing of Coal, Earth and Industrial Minerals 2009. So, um, this particular regulation, just like the first one that we shared, have similar um, conditions or similar, similar uh, recognition of specific environmental aspects and um, impacts and also mitigation measures that should be undertaken to reduce or um, avoid those impacts. So you can see, especially here, you can see effluents, um, effluent limitations for this uh, particular, this particular regulation, which has to do with mining and processing of coal ores. Mining and processing of coal ores. So you can see the provisions that has to do with treatment of effluents for, for mining activities, management of oil station and fuel dump. You can see also um, how to take samples of effluents and take the samples to the Rich Flood Laboratory. <laughs> but the Rich Flood Laboratory is not the regulation, but of course it is implied. Um, because Rich Flood has got a laboratory where you can take your effluents for testing. So uh, the sampling and analysis procedures for water, sediment and soil and so on and so forth, all of that is captured here. A Rich Flood laboratory is more than capable to undertake, I mean, to undertake um, the testing. So uh, you can see part five, industrial wastewater monitoring and reporting. Here you have the reporting requirements and so on and so forth. So um, the enforcement, how the agency goes about enforcement of this law is also captured and the penalties are also captured in this law and um, all of the emissions limitations are captured as well. The stack emission monitoring, the priority air pollutant guidelines, um, conventional pollutants schedule 10 and fugitive emission or sources during your operation as a miner is also captured in this. You can see this section that has to do with noise, pollution and control. So um, this one has to do with planning, uh, of permissible noise levels, though there is a separate um, regulation uh, regulating noise, but this is specific for the mining sector. So, and so on and so forth about this uh, 
this uh, regulation. Okay, you can see I'm actually using a copy of the Rich Flood Laboratory uh, guideline. This guideline, I had to scan it from the Rich Flood Lab, but you can see some of the activities that is used by the Rich Flood Laboratory. Uh, I mean, the standard that is used, the effluent limitation standards for mining and processing of coal, uh, ores, and industrial minerals. This is your annual effluent monitoring report format. And also this is the format for the test results that you will run showing the maximum permissible discharge limits for uh, the effluent that is being discharged. So this goes on and on and on. Grab a copy of this regulation and you will be very glad that you did. So um, I will move on now to share uh, another regulation as we go. Please bear with me for a second again. Okay, so this has to do with noise standards and controls 2009. Noise standards 2009, this is applicable also to, uh, this is not just for the mining sector actually, this has to do with uh, uh, almost everything, including even homes and churches. Uh, the noise standards that is permissible under the law and the noise control measures uh, and uh, the permitting that you need for noise to be able to do what you have to do and uh, the restrictions, you know, and so on and so forth. So uh, you can grab this to be able to guide you. Uh, not much I want to say here right now on it, but you can see the uh, uh, maximum permissible noise limits in decibels that you should look at for day and night for different um, facilities. It could be it could be for your mining operation, it could be for your industrial operation. You can see for industrial small scale production, 60 decibels during the daytime and 50 at night. Uh, 70 for industrial areas outside perimeter fencing, 70 maximum in the daytime and 60 at night. For any building, including churches, you can see the limitations. So this uh, is useful for both the manufacturing and the mining um, mining sector. So I will quickly go now to share another um, law with you or guidelines. Let, let me go to the guidelines and then we can quickly, um, I can see there are some comments, I think. Uh, please put your questions down so that we can deal with them as much as possible. Let me pull out the other one just a second, please. Okay, so I found it. Here is um, the guidelines for the production of environmental protection, environmental protection and rehabilitation program. Um, I am tempted to say that I should have defined some of these terms, but there's no problem. Let's run through it. You can see this is a bit recent, it's 2016. Uh, guideline for what is generally called EPRP in the mining sector. That's Environmental Protection and Rehabilitation Program. Uh, considering the environment, there are a lot of abbreviations, so you don't need to worry to want to know all of them by heart, but this is usually called the EPRP for Protection and Rehabilitation of the Environment after during and after the operation of the miner. So, well, I grabbed this from the Rich Floor Technical Department. <laughs> so, um, you can see the contents, the table of content for this, uh, for the preparation of the EPRP. We'll go down deep into it. Okay, so I would like to stay here to talk about the resentment plan. Don't forget the name is Environmental Protection um, and 
rehabilitation plan, but we have the component of resettlement also in this plan. Uh, as you are aware, some of the mining sectors before you commence, you have to undertake what is called resettlement um, action plan, RAP, R-A-P, RAP. You know, but for the mining sector, you can see the introductory uh, right up here, and I read, mining can cause both temporary and permanent displacement, hence the need for resettlement plan. Depending on the scale of displacement and location of the mine site, a resettlement plan is required to cover areas like public consultation and disclosure. Okay, guiding principles for resettlement valuation process relevant to the community, compensation, eligibility, compensation and entitlement matrix, and also how grievances have been addressed and so on and so forth. So this is actually um, a part of EPRP, a part of the document that needs to be spelled out. Though for uh, the mining, uh, for the EPRP, this is not very detailed as will be in the wrap but uh, it is required also to mention how these have been managed. If people have been displaced from their original place of habitation because of your project, then you have to, there are a lot of considerations. Like in the, in the EIA study, you have to consider um, as livelihoods that will be lost and also how to restore the livelihood which we normally capture in the in the livelihood restoration planning so this will be contained at the at the mine uh, at the EPRP alongside some of these uh, guiding principles that have to be looked into the format is actually in the guideline as well and uh, it mentions that some EMS system you know skeletally mentioned here that EMS is required for uh, all the mining sites as much as possible. So this is just a guideline showing the format that is required for um, a format that is required for the production guidelines for the production of environmental protection and rehabilitation uh, program report. So I would go to, I think I have two more guidelines to show you. Okay, sorry, I had a little technical hitch about my internet, but I think I'm fully back now. So, um, this is another one that I would like to show before the last one. This is more recent. This is 2017. It has to do with uh, the operational guidelines for Miremco, that's Mineral Resources and Environmental Management Committee. I actually worked with this committee for a particular project in Nigeria, Kaduna State, um, for a particular quarry, and I was quite impressed by the way that the Miremco coordinated the activities of uh, compensations where uh, Rich Flood was to undertake um, a compensation arrangement for the communities who are going to be losing their lands and also to plan some livelihood restoration programs and also to um, coordinate the production of the CDA, Community Development Agreement, uh, and, and the signing, the facilitation of the signing. So this particular community, we brought in the Miremco and Sorry, another technical hitch. Sorry about that. So I was giving you a narration about the uh, my experience working with Miremco and I was really very glad to find that there is an operational guideline for all of the Miremco's um, operations as regards to the mining sector. This is really, really a good one because uh, I was saying before the internet interrupted me that we had a good relationship with uh, the community, initially the community uh, before we came in 
a community wasn't accepting so many things. But when we came in and in collaboration with Miremko, we were able to settle some uh, not so important disputes, but disputes that was capable of stopping the project in the first place. So uh, we were able to tackle with that and we were able to get the community and the proponent at that time, we were able to get both of them to be on the same page in terms of the terms and conditions of the CDA, terms of compensation, and also how the operations is going to affect them, the aspect of the operations and the impact that they are going to suffer. All of that, we comprehensively uh, tackled it by uh, some steps of disclosure. We, we have a training actually on stakeholders engagement that was done by uh, the technical team in Abuja, Rich Flood technical team in Abuja. You can find that training also on the YouTube channel. It has to do with stakeholders engagement. All of the uh, principles of stakeholders engagement, we call it SEP, stakeholders engagement planning. All of the principles uh, that is taught in that course, all of it we put into, into use together with Miremco and we were able to achieve some good results for the project to commence and then later on we follow up on the operations of the uh, mining projects and uh, I mean the followed up with the operation of the um, of the mine and we, we we saw that everything went as as planned because we worked with Miremco so Miremco is actually an agency I mean, a committee that is very good to bring about uh, for your work, for your project, your mining project, and also your mining operation when it eventually commences. So if you see the uh, section seven here, you know, and section, the entire section seven, you can see section 7.7 .7, that has to do with sensitization of communities, you know, uh, it's quite very, very important to, to sensitize the community about your project. And when Miracle is involved, it makes it a lot easier. Most especially when Rich Flood is the one tackling this for you. We work with all the stakeholders that are concerned and we make sure that um, if there are grievances, we tackle it. If there are none, we just move quickly with the um, provisions or whatever needs to be done and then it is done and you can smoothly operate your project and continuously engage with the community as a major stakeholder of your project you know we, we actually rank communities as important uh, people because they are impacted by your project they are affected in all ways and they want to uh, contribute to the success of your project. We believe they should want to own your project and make sure, I mean, your operation and make sure that it is, it is uh, uh, um, successful, you know, throughout the life cycle of the project. So grab that course on stakeholders engagement and you will enjoy it. Uh, if you can grab it by yourself, at least your HSC manager for every mine site or quarry site should be able to to take a look at some of the training courses of Rich Flood on the YouTube channel and watch them and in fact use them as training models for your staff so that you can uh, understand all the requirements that it is um, but not so much not too much but easy to understand and of course with the backup of Rich Flood you'll be able to um, get to implement them without much stress at all. So I would now share with you the next um, uh, regulation or guideline. I think that's the last one, good news. <laughs> that's the last one. Let me check, just a second. Okay, I found it. Here is um, the guidelines for the production of community development agreement in the solid mineral sector. This is 2014. So um, what a CDA, Community Development Agreement, is an agreement between the community and the operator of either the mining site or the quarrying site, between the community and the all communities 
and the operator. We had an instance where there were so many communities uh, impacted by the by a particular project. So that's why I'll say communities. So the CDA, Community Development Agreement, like I said, is a document that has to show what the community and the operator have agreed, in fact, before commencement of the project, what they have agreed to do together for each other and how to support each other um, in order to ensure a smooth running of the operation. So communities are a key stakeholders for every mining project because in if it's a quarry you are going to be apart from the mineral title area you're going to um, be um, impacting them either they may have to relocate their farmlands or they may have to even evacuate leave the uh, project area completely because of the quarry operation because of safety issues within a particular kilometer square uh, uh, that you should look at before commencement of your project. So uh, the communities that will be losing their farms, they have to be a form of compensation separately uh, from what it is captured in the CDA. In the CDA, it's not for persons, it's for communities because I see some operators mistake land agreement with CDA. These are two different um, these are two different documents. If you are taking my land because of your quarry, it's different from you tackling what a CDA, what my community is supposed to benefit from your operation. So if you're taking my land, you have to talk to me. We have to agree in a resettlement kind of framework or a compensation kind of framework. We have to agree and then eventually I will either leave or sell off, I mean, or get compensated or either I'm resettled to, to continue in order to minimize the impact of your project on me as a person. But for the community development agreement, it's looking at the, the interest of the entire community as a stakeholder for your project. So uh, there's a series of engagement that takes place before you finally have a draft copy of a development uh, agreement between uh, you and the, and the company, I mean, you and the community. You, as, when I say you, I mean the operator and the community. So uh, the series of meetings would include um, uh, both uh, women group, men group, youths, farmers, uh, hunters, uh, you know, different social groups and also economic groups of the community will have to be engaged on a consistent manner to be able to find out what really they want to be captured in this uh, agreement. Um, let me share an experience here. When you have um, a community that do not want you to talk to their women, like in some locations in Nigeria, we've had such instance where the men will say, no, talk to only us. We don't allow our women to see anybody sit down and have meetings. I mean, we are men, we are in charge and we take care of everything. So whatever we tell you is what the women want. And so when you go about that in that way, by the time you're meeting with the women, you're actually going to be hearing a different story entirely. A different story entirely. So it is important to do the engagement in uh, uh, with different focus groups um, using different both qualitative and quantitative uh, data gathering techniques and also um, both secondary and the primary, most especially primary data directly from the sources. Uh, as much as possible, I am making, simplifying this uh, presentation in a way that you understand. But if I have to use some technical terminologies, you can just uh, chat down your questions and I'll break it down further because I wouldn't like to um, do, uh, finish this presentation and you are not understanding 
uh, what I am saying. But in essence, what I'm saying is that there has to be a lot of engagement, a lot of talking, a lot of talking and talking with the communities and documentation of this talking in a systematic manner in order to come up with an agreement that uh, they want to uh, go by. We want projects to be sustainable. We want community buy-in for your project. We don't want a project that gets started and a section of the community now comes about to say that uh, they weren't consulted or they were impacted in a way and they weren't settled and that they will not accept these or they will not accept that. A case study in Nigeria is the um, Niger Delta area. You don't want that to happen for your projects. That is why first things first, this guideline should be followed for the development of uh, the community development agreement, for the production, I mean, <laughs> of the community development agreement. And uh, until approval is gotten, all of the procedures is actually listed in this document because of time, I won't be able to flip through all of it, but the guidelines are all captured there, how the consultations are supposed to go and how the uh, uh, objective of the CDA is supposed to be achieved. Uh, for the sake of some people asking what is supposed to be contained in the CDA, it's basically some simple development agenda that you should have as an operator or as a proponent, you should have for the community. For instance, if it's a community where they are very backward and maybe there are no sources of water, one thing you could consider is to um, have a borehole drilling in some uh, if it's a small community, maybe one or two locations in the community that can make it accessible to the users or uh, you check out the improvements that you need to do maybe on the existing water infrastructures in the community. So that is one thing. Another thing could be some capacity building for selected uh, community persons or vulnerable people, you know, to be able to boost their economic, um, uh, the capacity to earn money or to live better than how they are living when you came in. This can be captured in the CDA. Another thing you can capture in the CDA is um, maybe if, depending on the project and the magnitude of the project, some big projects and some are small projects. So, but maybe road grading or road construction, we're actually very careful putting that in the CDA somehow because of uh, some conflicts that have arisen due to uh, adding this clause in your CDA. But at Rich Flood, we have a legal firm, Kronos Legal, that we normally use for such uh, CDA drafting and to make sure that the clauses are. Uh, um, acceptable by both the community and the uh, proponent. So uh, usually in the CDA, we, we after so much consultation, we allow the community to pick their representatives, you know, in the women's circle, the youth circle, the farmer's circle, the men's circle, we pick representatives that will sit in for the entire community and I will also sign their sections in the CDA. So we follow the, the format for the CDA has to be followed, I mean, and uh, submitted to uh, the MEC department and uh, they witness the signing process and they also have the MEC department. MEC is Mines Environmental Compliance Department. They also have their section where they ought to sign uh, that they witness the entire process and then the CDA is submitted and then approval is gotten for the project. So this is quite um, an interesting process and it makes the proponent and the community to be uh, close to each other, to love the project. In fact, they own the project. It promotes project ownership in, in a very, very good way. So it's, 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 a, it's a commendable guideline and it's uh, something to really look into for your project. So I will try to find my PowerPoint slide and get back to you. Just give me another second. There we go. So um, 
Yeah. So I think I have covered, let me see, all of these areas as planned. Uh, yes, we have covered this for the mining and processing of coal, for the noise standard, quarrying and blasting. We have also covered for the CDA and, uh, oh, I skipped this number five. Please go and get that presentation on the YouTube channel, you will find this. But we were able to cover uh, the guidelines for EPRP and also, oh, we missed number seven but we also covered number eight. So I will still leave it as it is so that we can make some progress so that I can conclude my presentation for others to come in. So um, now these are the general regulatory demands on site. Once you, um, um, before you commence your operation, you are supposed to have what we call environmental and social impact assessments, or if you like EIA, environmental impact assessment report. Uh, first, the exercise comprehensively done for two seasons, wet, uh, wet and dry season or dry and wet season as the case may be, and as at the time that you're applying for your license. So if you ask me specific questions, I'll be able to answer them, but we have comprehensive trainings for each aspect of this that I have listed for ESIA, for uh, CDA, for EPRP, and also for environmental auditing. Now, environmental and social impact assessment um, is a systematic process that is being undertaken in order for uh, the impact of your project to be determined and uh, uh, in order for the aspects of your projects to be uh, determined as well and also in order to develop um, to predict some certain impact of your project and also find ways to reduce the impact or to avoid it entirely where possible. So this is an introductory um, presentation, so I will not be going into the details of the entire processes, but also Rich Flood has a training that has been done for these processes and you can find it on the YouTube channel. And also if you need a customized training for your team members, you can also call us at Rich Flood. Or if you need an ESIA to be done for your, um, uh, proposed project or your or yes of course proposed project you can get in touch with us because like I said in my introduction ESIA is done before commencement of your project itself so uh, now when you're done with environmental and social impact assessment you have what we call an environmental impact statement which is listing um, the manner with which the project should proceed in a sustainable way. You know, the impact statement is listing that after which you are going to be issued an environmental impact assessment certificate by the Federal Ministry of Environment. So the EIS is a document that you get after you have uh, conducted your EIA fully conducted and fully executed. So it comes like an approval with some specific conditions that you are to consider in the implementation of your projects or in the operation of your project. So and um, this, uh, uh, the approval you get is an important document that usually when you are about to commence your operation, you send it to the uh, regulatory arm of uh, the Federal Ministry of Environment, I mean the enforcement arm of the Federal Ministry of Environment, which is Nestria. Nestria will now follow up with you to make sure that after every three years, you conduct your environmental audit. So um, important to mention also, after your EIA have been conducted, you have uh, impact mitigation monitoring. We have a training on that too that needs to be conducted in a periodic uh, manner. I think uh, every quarter, quarterly uh, mitigation monitoring to make sure that throughout your construction phase, you are following uh, the guidelines that have been, the plan that have been set out in the environmental management plan, which is a component of the ESIA. So the mitigation monitoring will ensure that you 
monitor all of the impacts and uh, for instance if there is dust it will make sure that you take care of the dust by using uh, uh, practicable technology to do that you know on your site so during the monitoring that's impact mitigation monitoring that has been done and then when the operation commences you now go for the environmental audit which is the last bullet point that i have on this slide you go for environmental audits where you audit the operation and see that it is in line with the regulations that i have earlier shared with you and that it is in line with uh, the uh, recommendations that have been developed the plans that have been developed during your eia the environmental auditing uh, exercise make sure that all of that is being complied with and if you're quite a a, a firm or an operator that wants to go for higher standards not just for uh, national or minimum standard you can consider the environmental auditing that you can do for uh, uh, taking a look at international standards uh, uh, for that, which I'll share with you shortly. So the EPRP I have shared with you earlier is just a plan or a program that you will use to make sure that um, uh, the environment is protected and that uh, it is being rehabilitated so that we don't come to your site uh, or maybe the regulators come to your site and um, there are pits all over the place which constitutes a lot of hazard for the communities or even for your staff you know as an operator so the EPRP helps to take care of that and uh, if you find our course on the EPRP, you will see that there's what they call the EPRF. EPRF is the Environmental Protection and Rehabilitation Fund. The F of it is the fund, the fund that has been contributed to make sure that the environment is rehabilitated even after the decommissioning of your project. That's when you are closing up, so to speak, when you're leaving the site or when the project is completed. And you want to shut down the operation you know how to go about the rehabilitation and the amounts uh, to be used for the rehabilitation this is usually captured also in the EPRP so I hope I have done justice to this slide I move forward so all the recommendations that I want to bring up is that um, you should consider also uh, international standards for your operation from quality to environment to safety you know occupational health and all that is required for the mining sector is to be considered and rich flood happens to be administering these professional courses and certification as well in collaboration with uh, PECB and uh, other partners listed on um, the screen so we we coordinate your training to make sure that you do the training usually it's a five-day training and examination which you do to to understand every aspect of your business your management systems and how to improve on them and uh, uh, you you take uh, your courses it depends if it's foundation or implemented as different sections of the courses that you need to take to make sure that you follow the standard that is required for your operation so you give me a second to share i think this will be my last sharing that i will do before i i hand over to the moderator just give me a second to pull out uh, the page that has to do with all of the international standards that we can uh, international standards and the trainings that we can facilitate for your operation so that you can um, do things in a proper way and uh, boost your ability to uh, deliver on quality service for both your customers and your staff and to work in a sustainable manner that keeps both community customers, uh, uh, staff and uh, shareholders you know keep everybody uh, uh, maintained in, in a standard way so just give me a second let me pull out the document okay here we go these are the array of uh, courses and standards 
that uh, we can manage for you to become really international um, um, certified, uh, I mean international in your operation. The higher standards should be what you should be targeting as an operator in the mining sector. So you can see uh, quality management training course. This is highly recommended. This is ISO 9001. And in the health and safety sustainability section, you can see uh, um, environmental management training courses, 14001. You can see uh, 26,000, ISO 26,000 social responsibility training courses. And you can see um, uh, occupational health and safety, actually 45001. You can see also environmental communication training course. You can see um, material flow cost accounting training course and also recommended for the mining sector is environmental risk assessment training course. So you can see uh, hazard identification and uh, occupational health and safety risk assessment training course down there and so many other um, courses that we think that is important. It's quite comprehensive. This is not exhaustive, but you can contact us uh, info at richflood.com for this or you can even contact me directly comfort at richflood.com to be able to share with you um, um to be able to share with you the the uh courses that you may need that is specific to your operation or that is relevant to what you do you know we can advise you on specific uh, um courses that we think that you should consider so i will now be attending to questions so that uh we can make some good progress and and be able to move very fast to the other activities of the day thank you very much for listening so i will take a look at the questions and then get back to answer them uh, very shortly please and thank you very much ma for that wonderful presentation explaining extensively on the environmental regulations and guidelines we have in Nigeria. Quite a number of questions and comments has been coming in so far and um, I'll just read some of them so that you can answer and then we move on to the next stage. First we have a participant, Mujida Ajibola a sustainability educator based in Nigeria. She would like to know what remediation and compensation should be carried out by mining companies in Pape area of Abuja. What remediation and compensation should be carried out by mining companies in Pape area of Abuja? She says there is so much degradation and the companies are not taking responsibility. That first, which agency of government is responsible for this as well? I think she would like to know the regulatory bodies that are concerned with ensuring that there is adequate remediation processes after the mining operations. And then she would like to know the kind of compensation and remediation that should be carried out by mining companies in Pape area of Abuja. I'll hand over back to you now, ma. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Adiola. Sorry, I had to take a break to take some water. Um, thank you, Mujida Ajibola, for the question. Uh, what recommendation and compensation? Like I um, explained in the presentation, um, depending on the scenario and depending on what impact you have identified. I know that the Papi area in Abuja is overwhelmed by quarrying activity. That's correct. And um, I'm aware that the communities have been uh, complaining in one way or the other. There are even lawsuits. I'm aware of that, of the impact that uh, some communities have 
suffered and uh, wanting to have redress. So uh, basically we have to know what impact we're talking about and then we can talk about the remedial action that the, um, um, the operator should look at. But let me just give an example. Let's say that uh, because I'm aware of a particular client of ours that uh, did some blasting and the community people, I mean some houses got some cracks and some uh, there were fly rocks that fell on their roofs and uh, so on and so forth. So what we did in that case was first and foremost to uh, slow down the operation to look at their documents and after looking at the documents to check the incidents that have occurred and then to see what uh, the document provided and then to check if the operation is actually complying with uh, the provisions in their documents because it's one thing to have an ESIA done, it's one thing to have recommendations to be implemented and it's another thing to implement it. It's, there are two different things. Some of these documents are just like uh, books kept on a bookshelf. They are not, um, there's no standard that has been followed, there are no conformities. They don't even know about the regulations, I mean the staff. So when that happens, you will see a lot of uh, incidents and accidents that will lead to complicated issues, most especially with um, quarrying and most especially when it comes to blasting activities. So uh, the remedial actions that can be taken in this case that I have mentioned is to stop the operation, to look at the community or the houses that are affected, to relocate them if possible or to resettle them or to pay some form of compensation to them to leave. Because when an operation is uh, ongoing, it's, it's, except there is a time frame, maybe it's just six months operation. But if it has to be with five years, 10 years, you know, depending on the life cycle or the license tenure, and of course, even when the license, um, even when the license is expired, it will have to be renewed. So you have a long time to, to look at. So, what needs to be done is to relocate such people. And if you're talking about dust, another aspect is that uh, they have to put on some wetting systems that mitigate against that. I hope I answered the question, Adiola. You can move to the next one. Time is not uh, on our side. Okay, thank you very much, Ma. You were able to do justice to that. Um, we also have another question here from Mr. Boyega, who is an Echo District accredited professional representing Enviromax Global Resource Limited in Ibadan or your state. He says, thank you for the brilliant expose on the regulations. It seems we have so much laws that it will be overwhelming to carry along holistically. And he has three questions. The first one is, how best can these laws be integrated into operations of a mining company for full compliance? How best can these laws be integrated into operations of a mining company for full compliance? Also, it talks about the exclusivity of um, natural resources and mining to the federal government, which seems to be contradictory with land use and rights of state governors on issuance of C of O. So he's therefore asking that how have we been able to navigate this path in view of communal conflicts using the CDA. And thirdly, you would like to know if there are criteria to be met to get Ministry of Mines accreditation for a startup company and what role can Rich Flood play to guide or support in this quest? I hope you've got that, Ma. I will hand over to you to respond. Oh yeah, that's a lot. Um... I hope you can still hear me. Yeah, okay. That's a lot of qu uh, questions from uh, Mr. Gbinga Olon Femi. Um, okay. So first, uh, how best can these laws be integrated into operations of a mining company for full compliance? Um, that's why you have the instruments that we have explained uh, before now. If you do an ESIA, you would have satisfied an aspect of the law and the ESI will provide for you um, some certain steps that you need to take for that for full compliance for your operation and also environmental auditing and all of those uh, learning objectives that we had listed 
in the um, flyer for this event, which will take place in the afternoon session. Um, Adiola will be taking us on that. All of that is actually uh, given birth to by the regulations. So once um, the operators uh, follow these regulations, uh, they will be fine with full compliance. And most especially if uh, Rich Flood is on board and has a retainership with you, uh, you can be very sure that all the way going, you will be advised on how to comply with uh, the full um, extent of the law with regards to the mining uh, sites. And then the exclusivity of natural resources mining to federal government seems to be contradictory. Okay, so for the mining sector, we have, uh, I'm looking at the second question for, from Mr. Binga now. How have you been able to navigate this path in view of communal conflicts? There will always be conflicts when the right things are not done. And even when the right things are done, sometimes um, you will still have conflicts. It's the conflict management strategy that you need to put in place, which first of all starts with uh, stakeholders engagement planning and implementation. Uh, like I said, there is a course that was done uh, on SCP, stakeholders engagement planning. If you go through it, you will see step by step how to go about engaging with these communities and make sure that they are on your side. Otherwise, they will not be on your side and you're going to be having communal conflicts every now and then, you know, on your projects and you don't want that to happen. So once things are done systematically and the right um, stakeholders are carried along, you'll be fine. You'll be fine dealing with the communities. And I'm aware of um, duplications of law, but that is why the mining ministry have come up with um, a specific uh, law or guideline that has to do with the CDA that is specific with the mining sector. Some state may not have amended their laws to capture mining or may just capture it shabbily, but the CDA have a comprehensive guide on how this is going to go about. And also the Miremco, when they are involved, and if Rich Flood is involved, we'll make sure that you comply with everything as it's supposed to be. And are there criteria to be met to get Ministry of Mines accreditation for a startup company? And what is the role of rich flood? Yes, um, I want to assume that you mean if there are, uh, if you want to get a license as a small scale uh, miner, there is what they call the SSML, small scale mining lease that they can give to you and they encourage Nigerians to go all out and be part of the mining sector so that we can build the sector um, ourselves, even though we work together with uh, uh, foreigners and uh, investors, you know, foreign direct investments and all that. But uh, for a small scale miner, you can get what they call the small scale mining list. And there are list of criteria, yes, that you have to follow. One of it is the EPRP. Another one is the ESIA. Another one is the consent letter from the community. That means the community have to give you a consent or the landowners uh, with the with the knowledge of their chief or their community leader, they have to give you the consent to um, do an exploration on their site. And it depends on the mineral. That's actually another very long um, presentation. I don't think, I don't, ideally, I don't think we have a training in that area, but there are lots of requirements that you have to uh, satisfy. You can send me an email. I will be able to throw some more lights. I can have a Zoom meeting with you one-on-one -on -one and we can discuss that. Yes, Adiola, over to you. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, I believe we've been able to capture the questions we have. If there are further questions, please do send them to us using info at richflood.com and um, be rest assured that we'll respond to all your questions accordingly. We thank you for attending and for your contributions in this session. Adela, just a second, if you, if you don't mind. Sorry, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that everybody's satisfied. I'm seeing a lot of, I didn't know, I didn't know that people have sent me some private questions actually on my page. I was depending on Adiola, but let me just do a rundown in two minutes, please. Uh, what is the role of consent letter from operator in land agreement and CDA? That's from Mr. Ayodeji Adeitule. What is the role of consent letter? Consent letter is to show that the community have given you consent to come to their land. And without that, you can make any progress. 
So my question is, an, um, as an environmental consultant, how can you help companies to develop EPRP and CDA? Does Ministry of Mines accredit consultants to carry out these documents? Uh, no, the Ministry of Mines, as far as I know, the Ministry of Mines does not uh, give accreditation, but Federal Ministry of Environment does and uh, Nestria does. So you can do a private email like Adiola said, and we can put you through what to do. And uh, Dr. Uh, Agbaje Maruf, um, what would be your best advice to an early career geoscientist looking forward to joining the manufacturing, mining, oil and gas industry? A postgraduate study, maybe? Professional courses? Does Rich Law International Limited have a career section that can guide aspiring professionals on how to join the fold? Thank you, Dr. Agbaje, for that question. Uh, right now, uh, we do not have any mentorship programs. The best mentorship program we have is the training courses that we do and that we upload. I also saw something like somebody asking if this video will be available for um, viewing. Yes, it will be available for viewing. It will be on the YouTube channel. You can just type the title of the training and it will show up. So um, for Dr. Agbaje wanting to um, look at mentorship, uh, we don't have a designed mentorship program, but this is what can be worked out because I know Dr. Agbaje is also um, a respected consultant. So we can, we can look at that together and we can develop something for uh, continuous professional development for our young professionals. That will be in, in, in place. Thank you, Adiola. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Ma. Actually, there is another question that came in again from Ayodeji Adetula. It says, how do mine operators correct social impacts not captured at the beginning? Who bears the costs, the consultant or the company? That's the last <laughs> question I'll take, Ma. Okay, uh, the, the company, you are fully responsible, the operator, the company, the proponent. You're fully responsible for what happens on your site, how it happened, and everything about it. Uh, the consultant is just a third party that you have engaged maybe to show you the way, but of course the consultant have the responsibility, the ethical and professional responsibility to make sure that you are uh, in the know about every um, uh, law that you're supposed to be in compliance with and how to go about the compliance and what you need to put in place. Yes, the consultant will, but in most cases from my few years experience, I see that these um, rec recommendations to avoid incidents or accidents on your site have already been captured uh, in the document that you have been given. Even if it's an environmental audit, there is an environmental management plan that have been developed. The question is, have the operator gone through the document and have you uh, complied with the provisions in the documents? And also that was why I ended my presentation with international standard certification for your system, your services, your staff, you know, and all that. Once you do that, you'll be expanding the scope of the possibility of knowing what to do and how to do it because ignorance is really, really very expensive. Over to you, Adiola. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, with this, we've come to the end of the morning session. We want to say thank you very much for attending and for your contribution in this session. In the afternoon section, which is by 3 p.m. precisely, we'll look at how to marry the environmental regulations with our learning outcomes, being the Environmental Impact Statement, EIS, Hazardous Substance Storage Plans, HS. SP, Environmental Audit, Environmental Protection and Rehabilitation Program, EPRP, Community Development Agreement, that's CDA. Now, it is important for us to bear in mind that this course is an introductory course, which is basically designed to familiarize all participants with the basic knowledge that is required for understanding the regulations and these terminologies. However, for participants in Nigeria, we will be having a full seven days course to go into details and ensure that all our participants can plan, implement and monitor the execution of these instruments in any operation that they may find themselves, either as operator or as a regulator or even as an environmental practitioner. And we'll be dropping the link for the registration shortly, but it will be a paid event. 
However, I will add this, don't miss the opportunity to add a new skill to your skill set. And for selected operators, Rich Flood Foundation is putting together a scholarship to sponsor a limited number of participants for this training. Please visit the Rich Flood website for details, which is www.richflood.com. In the same light, this training is going to be repeated by the Rich Flood Rwanda office for our participants from Rwanda. Please look out for the details on the Rich Flood website and register accordingly. Thank you once again for participating. See you in the afternoon.